I'm joined by Catherine Monder, co-founder and designer of Threadtails. Thank you so much for joining me, Catherine. No problem. Thanks for having me. So the reason I wanted to speak with you is that from what I've seen, Threadtails is a unique luxury fashion brand because what you do is you value ethics and the environment first. And we'll talk about mm -hmm. what other companies do and how the industry works in general. But I think this ethos uh, really translates into something that I found really interesting, which is uh, the fact that you're one of the very few brands to use the lotus flower to make exactly. your garments. So um, yeah. lots to unpack there. And I'd love if you could just give us some context and level set just by providing a little bit of background on what exactly is Threadtails. Sure, yeah. Um, so Threadtails uh, really began because um, I was working in fast fashion. Um, I was dismayed with the way that the suppliers were being treated um, in working to impossible margins, being pushed to the point where they could barely operate. Um, I experienced it firsthand for many years. Um, my career in fast fashion was probably the last six years of my career. And um, it really pushed me towards making um, a decision internally that if I could find a way to do something more meaningful and more purposeful in my, in my career, I think um, I would you know, jump on that opportunity. Um, so um, it began really with my mother. It sounds a bit strange, but um, she was my inspiration. Um, she nice. is, she's always been um, a very inspiring lady who travels to remote parts of the world and trains birthing assistants to reduce mortality rates mm -hmm. um, in countries such as Mongolia and Myanmar. Um, and she travels like long distances to, um, to serve and help and train these women. And she's 70 now and she's still doing it. And she's wow. incredibly strong, motivated, determined, generous woman who also happens to have um, brought me up in nature and appreciating nature. So those two values have been very sort of embedded in me from when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And um, really, um, the moment which came to me where I decided to start Thread Tales was simply that she found this amazing fabric in um, remote communities in Myanmar where they weave a fabric out of lotus flower. Um, so it's basically, um, well, I claim it's the most sustainable fiber out there in the world simply because it is every process and every part of the production of that fabric, finished, finished piece of fabric is actually hand produced. Um, and the fabric itself um, has an amazing spiritual story behind it, which really, really intrigued me. So um, they, they basically believe in its spiritual property. As you know, the lotus flower is a very spiritual flower. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, the Buddhist culture believe in its spiritual sort of, you know, um, powers almost. So therefore, they actually regard it as a sacred piece, which they would donate to the high ranking monks in the Buddhist culture. So this is the actual fabric. The actual cloth, the finished fabric. So obviously the fabric is made from the stems, um, hand extracted, um, hand spun, hand woven, and everything about the, the process of this, this mm. material is produced by hand. So, and then the end result is this beautiful fabric that is in, in its natural form, is very actually very soft to touch. It's kind of like a cross between a linen and a raw silk, wow. if you can imagine that. Um, and me being a bit um, of a fabric geek, <laughs> um, having been very frustrated working in fast fashion for many years, looking at polyesters and horrible fabrics, um, I just fell in love with the fabric and the story and the values behind the, the fabric and everything about the, the actual meaning and the purpose of, of, of the fabric itself mm -hmm. um, made me and drove me to decide to set up thread tails. Um, so that was that was a simple sort of you know light bulb moment that came through this fabric that my mum bought back on one of her trips. Yeah, that's a really cool cool way to get started. Um, yeah, it's such a an amazing story in terms of I'm sure just working with it, it's it has so much history not just for you but for the culture as well, which is Absolutely, very yeah. which is really powerful I think. And yeah. just to, to go back to you mentioned sustainable uh, or most sustainable fabric, so I, I'd love to go down that rabbit hole a bit, a bit more. Yeah. Um, in order to provide a bit of context in, in terms of why Threadtails is so special, uh, could you let us know a little bit about what exactly is fast fashion? Uh, you mentioned polyester. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's there's much more to it than, than yeah. just a little just the uh, the tools or the fabrics used. Absolutely. Um, well, essentially, it's a business model that was created by um, essentially following trends off the catwalk and getting them onto the shop floor as quickly and as cheaply as possible, mm -hmm. without any consideration for the people or the planet. Um, so um, 
that would probably be you know a, a simple summary of it um there many collections are produced a year in, in order to keep up with trends um the the price is key obviously the lower price you know the more competitive you're going to be so um constantly being you know pushed on price in terms of the supplier base and um fabric doesn't come into it really it's just about getting that look across so it like i mentioned the polyester that's probably a big you know percentage of the collections that that you see on the high street mm -hmm. um which is obviously you know in terms of its um sustainability is, is is probably you know apart from cotton one of the worst fibers you could possibly you know make clothes out of for many reasons interesting and so what what exactly about it is in terms of fast fashion in general what's the negative impact on the environment well, apart from creating so many tons of fabric and, and garments that then just get worn a few times and discarded, mm -hmm. um, the land the landfill issue is one issue. Um, obviously, using a lot of man-made fibres means that none of these fabrics actually break down or you know biodegrade. So you know they'll be in our you know in our planet for years to come and won't be breaking down. Um, mm -hmm. Polyester itself um, sheds microplastics into the wash, so that's also you know a big issue um, in terms of you know the, the fabrics that get used, um, and it's just you know this whole um, mindset that you know the society now have through the introduction of you know this quick fix is that they expect it now and they and they want it, and if mm -hmm. it's not there, then you know they'll be frustrated because they're so used to being able to you know to find things quickly and, and be able to you know look hot without you know any consideration consideration for the um, people or the planet yeah basically i see what you mean so lots of i i'm i i read somewhere as well that the fast fashion i perhaps this was what you you were saying is um uh, because of those very intense deadlines i mean sometimes there's new a new fashion comes out every week i, I read somewhere yeah. i think on average so in terms of how much work needs to be done uh in order to meet those expectations not only is environment the kind of environment we live in uh, ends up being polluted uh, it's also really bad for the people working in it absolutely yeah i mean at the end of the day you know to achieve those prices you know um for some of the you know see um very cheap you know high street brands that we know um you would be looking at a five pound t-shirt you know yeah. there's no way that um that can be produced by paying a fair wage um as we know and the rain rena plaza disaster in bangladesh um mm -hmm was one of the examples of how you know the workers you know are being you know unfairly treated in terms of you know the safety of where you know their environment they work in you know the hours they're working the way you know the money they've been paid you know to produce those those goods yeah. and none of this is taken into consideration and i've experienced it firsthand from traveling to factories around the world so i know i you know i know firsthand you know what what it's really like so I, it pushed me more and more to want to do something you know which you know took into consideration um, the ethics and the environment of my business. Yeah, and so how, I think that's such a great, great uh, dovetail into how is Threadtails different from that kind of yeah. sad gray picture? What's the colorful, <laughs> bright one that Threadtails is? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we're uh, um, doing our bit, you know, and it's a small bit, but it's, you know, it's everything helps towards, you know, um, creating a more positive planet, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we obviously use natural fibres, which is very important to us um, in terms of, you know, the fact that they can biodegrade. Um, so therefore, the Lotus was the beginning of the journey, but the mm -hmm. fabrics and fibres we've introduced since are um, sustainably sourced. Um, and we use many different um, fibres. I mean, cashmere is obviously one of them, and it can be the most contentious of the natural fibres. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so the issue with cashmere can be that um, it's become so like um, not even like you know an expensive luxury item anymore because you know it's become you know a seventy pound jumper is is out there in the market so therefore the quality of the cashmere has been reduced and the um, the, the demand for it's increasing so therefore the grasslands are being depleted oh, um, by the actually it comes from a goat if if people yeah. aren't aware it's actually in Mongolia <laughs> where the cashmere comes from and obviously it's from a, a certain goat and it's a certain climate that you know that the goat lives in that produces you know the best cashmere cashmere um, pashmina goats right yeah well there's pashmina goats there's all different breeds of the there's even a cashmere goat so yeah um, I, ju I just found out about that and i was uh, really yeah. excited by it i don't know why it's just so <laughs> funny to me that it was a goat i thought it was i always yeah. thought it was a sheep <laughs> <laughs> no it's, until you actually really study these things you don't realize but um cashmere itself um obviously you know is is a 
luxury noble fibre, which should be treated that way. And, you know, it was always a luxury fibre, but unfortunately, you know, the high street again have got their hands on it because it's a, such a popular uh, fibre now to, you know, get that sort of mid-price luxury yeah. that it's become, you know, no longer a valuable commodity. So we tend to use, well, we, we only use certified cashmere um, suppliers. Um, and essentially what that means is that... Um, N number one is that the herders are treated, you know, um, fairly and pay paid a fair wage. Number two, the, um, the 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 flocks, the herds of goats are um, are treated kindly because obviously, you know, they're being herded around the grasslands. Yeah. Um, and it's how they're treated, how they're it, how they're um, in terms of you know the medical attention they get if they need mm -hmm. it, in terms of how they're combed for their fur, which is not sh it's not shorn like a like a sheep. It's actually combed. It's the it's the soft long hair that's oh, really? used for the yeah for the cashmere itself. So obviously it's how they comb them. Um, it's also how they manage the grassland. So you you know it's about rotating the herds. And once one grassland area has been depleted to, to a certain extent, it needs to be rested and then mm -hmm. they need to be moved to another pasture. Um, whereas some you know companies would just let them roam and they would never manage the you know that side of it. So I guess you know knowing that the companies you use. Do you have all those, you know, um, practices in place? Basically, means you're, you know, you're you're getting cashmere that's fairly sourced. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, there's lots of um, stories behind all the fibers we use. So you know, yeah. we can talk for hours about it. But I, I think it's worth uh, it's worth going through some of the other ones because you said cashmere is the most contentious, and I, I think yeah. based on some of the other ones that you use, uh, it's probably yeah. the least. I would say, um, uh, perhaps interesting or or maybe yes, eclectic um, yeah because it's such a common fiber now right exactly and so what are some yeah. of those other ones that that you're using yeah so um we also use muslin free merino wool which uh, merino wool is becoming incredibly popular now in the particularly in the um, performance wear because it's got such great antibacterial properties okay. and um regulation of temperature but we we um didn't realize until we started sourcing it that actually i mean the sheep actually are mostly australia for, for merino wool mm -hmm. the the normal practice is to um remove the strips of the hind of the sheep without any anesthetic to prevent fly strike yeah. so fly strike can be you know a big problem in terms of you know producing enough wool because you know it, it prevents you know the sheep from producing the wool they need so we we prefer to source muesling free merino which basically doesn't use that cruel practice um, obviously it's a bit more intensive in terms of the farming it needs to be mm -hmm. they need to be washed more regularly and cared for more carefully um, but in the end and special diets can prevent fly strike as well but it's more costly so that's why it's not such a common um, merino wool to find in the market so we t we have to you know search for it it's not easy to find um so some of the the other fabrics you use which um i find um very interesting are camel and yak yes yeah, um, yeah. again <laughs> it's um it's not that popular at the moment but it's really? um i mean for me it's it's much more interesting than cashmere mm -hmm. it has an incredible um hand feel like you've never never felt particularly from the sources we buy again it's from inner mongolia these are both camels and yaks that you're talking um, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And they, again, it's the soft underbelly that they comb. So again, there's no shearing involved. You know, of course, you wouldn't shear a camel anyway. But they have a very long, soft underbelly that naturally sheds at times, certain times of the year, which is then collected. Um, so yes, it's um, quite, you know, it's quite a high-priced um, yarn for that reason. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not being produced in big quantities at the moment. But it's, for me, it's like our luxury premium part of our collection. Um, and... To, to add to the appeal we actually hand spin it as well which means that it has a beautiful texture mm -hmm. and it also gives um, another income to um, actually ladies who um, have only really trained in spinning they're not weavers um, and they often work on the farmland you know when in the right season and then they'll come into the workshops to spin so it's an extra income for them as well oh, cool. so we like it for that reason yeah that's really that's a that's a, a good way to support yeah. uh, the local community. Um, yeah. And I guess moving over to your uh, uh, to really the kind of crown jewel, I, I suppose, of mm -hmm. of thread tails to the lotus flower, because I think the lotus flower is. Um, I mean, I can understand camel yak. It, it's these yeah. are big, hairy animals that are have to stay warm in in pretty extreme climates. Um, but to think of a scarf made from a flower or actually like the flower of a water lily mm. i think is pretty unique um yeah. i was watching some videos on how they make it and um yeah 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the lotus flower itself and why how it works? Because it's yeah. um, until I, I sort of saw the process, I couldn't really understand what exactly was going on. Yeah. So um, it grows in abundance in certain parts of Myanmar in the lakes and mm -hmm. actually in other parts of Asia as well, such as Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, and it, you know, grows to a very tall length when the rains, um, rainy, during the rainy season, when the water levels are particularly high, mm -hmm. it grows to quite some length. It can be two metres even. Um, and literally um, it, the, the lakes are washed with pink flowers. So wow, if you can imagine, beautiful. you know, the site, it's an incredible sight. Um, and it's a great uh, flower itself because it's not just the stems which obviously is where the fiber comes from for the fabric but there's actually a lot of um other uses for the for the flower itself which mm -hmm. is why it's such a sustainable um material in, in its you know from yeah. the raw material itself you can for example there's medicinal uses for the actual seed head if you can imagine the seed head is actually what you would see in like a potpourri it's okay. very um oh yes it's i'm got actually going to share the screen here um yeah. just so we can get uh, I think this is the the pink flowers you're talking about on your we're just on the threadtalescompany.com yeah, exactly. website for the people yeah. who are uh, not watching this on YouTube. So there's um, I'm just I'll just briefly describe it. There's basically a man on a or, or there's a person I long boat. a man yeah on a long boat standing on the very edge um, like at the very front like a surfboard. Never understood how they balance, but <laughs> yeah. in any in any event, um, and this person is surrounded by blooming pink. Uh, water lilies i mean yeah. it's, it's incredible it's incredible um and so you were saying that part of the um the flower and i know exactly what you're talking about my uh, my mom has had the same potpourri for like <laughs> higher life and i've seen these little i've always wondered what they were they look like almost like yeah they're kind of flat and sort of like top. like craters yes. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah exactly they're little holes in them. yeah, yeah. um so that, that there's, there's seeds in there that got um, amazing properties medicinal properties i mean right. i have to say i wouldn't be the expert on exactly what they cure but there's mm -hmm. certainly um, properties within there um and the roots i also use to eat um in fact i had and was served a beautiful curry in Kashmir when i was working with my embroiderers there from the lotus uh, roots which was delicious wow um the leaves themselves are used to put rice in you know to instead of plates uh -huh. um and yeah so in in fact you know you may people may say oh, it's bad to pick the flowers when actually you know there's so many uses for these flowers and it's not like they don't um grow back very quickly so um you know i think you know for that reason you know it's a very sustainable crop and it doesn't use fertilizers it grows naturally so mm -hmm. um it's it's basically picked by hand and as you can see down if you scroll down there's a picture of the fiber coming out um yes. yeah and they do this by hand so you can actually watch this in the mm. workshops um and there's somebody's job just to do that <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll um, link to this video it's it's incredible yeah. i mean it, it in terms of what we're looking at here on the screen it's basically um the the stem of the flower is cut um by like a knife or a razor and then when you pull it apart uh it looks like almost like spider web yeah exactly lots of strands yeah. of spider web and yeah they it's got amazing structure yeah. to it um actually which is again a you know scientific thing which sometimes goes a bit over, over my head because i'm not a scientist but it sure. is incredible yeah is it a very um, strong material yeah it is actually yeah i mean it's got great properties and it's um uh, they, you know, I mean, whether you want to believe this or not, actually, yeah. um, going for one of the things is they actually believe you wear it and you get rid of um, all sorts of illnesses, headaches and lung issues. And, you know, they genuinely walk around with, with lotus wrapped around them whenever they feel sick. So, OK, <laughs> um, there must yeah, be something some, to it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, it's um, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's reasonably shower proof as well, which is something you wouldn't expect from a fabric that looks like a linen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't really stain very easily. Um, it's very breathable. Um, yeah. So I think there's lots of um, good qualities to it as a fabric. Mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously been a lot of, you know, um, talk of hemp for many years, but actually hemp is actually quite a scratchy, coarse fabric um when you feel it and this is not and it really does feel and the more you wear it the softer it gets um and there's two grades actually as well which is something quite interesting because um when i first went to myanmar it was 
the first time I met the, the workshop owner, he was showing me what we would call the tourist grade. So they were putting it, you know, out for sale for people coming around the workshops. Yeah. And um, and then at some point, you know, on my second or third trip, it was that was when they believed that I was serious about this business. You know, gotcha. that they went up to the rafters of the because they're like huts on stilts that they work from. The looms are all in these amazing wooden huts. Mm -hmm. They went up and picked this. What would they call the monks and the royal quality? um oh. which is much finer um than the Noticeably forest sense. grade yeah so we call it the, the monk and the royal although unfortunately the royal is not something that can be um trademarked i believe but it's a lovely name i love yeah, you know it's it really stuck is. with the brand and um it's it's a very much more superior quality it's finer it's more you know they they, they work it by hand more they spin it more they they soak it in rice for longer to soften it which is another thing that they do um to get it to that quality so we, yeah we were we were worthy of that quality at some point during our relationship <laughs> yeah well it must feel good to uh to know that they've that they trust you enough to yeah. show you basically the the stuff in the back um, yeah in terms of um in terms of the process in terms of what makes a difference between the difference between the monk slash royal fabric and the mm. tourist grade is that mostly about how they process it or is it actually different types of flowers yeah no it's um it's also to do with the length of the stem i believe and and oh, the time of the year that it's, it's picked mm. the time exactly that it's picked yeah interesting so mm. and how easy is it to work with um it's not actually that easy and um, because okay. um i mean the issue we had with working with myanmar is, is is a bit of a long story but it was really unfortunate that you know they're they're not used to working with you know um the western consumer and the quality mm -hmm. and the eye detail that we require for a luxury brand so when we were weaving with them um it was taking a lot of time to get the the consistent widths in the fabrics for example just you know things that are important to us but they may not you know be used to having those um quality you know yeah, um, yeah. issues so we we actually now um have, have, taken the yarn and we work with it in um, Nepal which is where the next story comes um, in the business um, now we we obviously you know had our you know our beginning which was the lotus but we we were certainly aware that you know to create a business that was going to be you know um, uh, eventually you know one that could you know have some you know um, long-standing sort of you know a uh, future we had to find other weavers that were more um, in tune to the the western eye I guess and the quality that is that is required of that. So I went on a, a sourcing um, platform, um, which is actually to sort called Common Objective, which is to source um, ethical suppliers and connect, you know, like-minded businesses. And sorry, what and was it called? A Common Objective. Common Objective. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I found um, basically she this this, this particular. Um, company just jumped out at me from the list of many many you know ethical um companies that were on the list mostly india based actually hmm. fair trade indian sort of factories um was this lady who was just a, a very small workshop in nepal who was italian um and she'd been working for social enterprise out in Kathmandu for for a period of time and she'd fallen in love with textiles and the hand weaving process and she was very keen to stay actually um she made a decision she wasn't going back to london which is where she was based originally to invest all of her savings in buying looms to give these people a livelihood again because actually the textile the weaving industry has had a decline over the years because of the mass production of cotton essentially mm. um and she, her idea was that she wanted to introduce luxury fibers um into hand weaving um and you know work with them to create a you know business that actually you know commercial and would appeal to you know western customers so she bought the loom she put all her savings into it and she she trained them all up to or you know has supported them in terms of you know um training them to understand how you know to work in a business and she's now 30 people strong and she's wow. an incredible um 
like you've never met someone that's so passionate and given her life to something that's actually very challenging you know it's it's not an easy path to take in life no you know it's it, i mean she tells me all London, sorts of yeah. stories yeah but also just trying to work, work with a different culture yeah. that don't understand you know deadlines and, and they're very relaxed about everything and you know just trying to gradually make them understand you know that if you want you know to have a sustainable vocation you have to you know you have to work hard you know you have to you know put all the effort in and so i think she's she's been really the the, the turning point for thread tales because she um and i just completely aligned with our business values in terms of she would um like me only want to work with natural fibers she uses eco dye eco dye source from switzerland mm. um from a big company that actually um, produced probably you know 20 percent of the dye dyes in the world now and obviously there's a big debate uh, for synthetic dyes versus vegetable dyes um, if you want to be 100% sustainable we and myself and, and the partner in Nepal decided that actually we want to use the, the eco dyes which are a synthetic based dye but the difference being that they're free from um, harmful chemicals such as formaldehyde and harmful metals such as lead and zinc and actually there's some carcinogenic chemicals in in the normal standard dyes as well so oh, wow. I think for us, you know, using those dyes that have the certification um, of which there are two main ones, GOTS is one and then Ocatex, which is another one. Mm -hmm. um, we made sure that we worked with those dyes, so only those dyes. And she's and I have worked very hard to create a collection that is moving the traditional look of, you know, textiles forward in, in a modern way, but still, you know, embracing the old culture and tradition and heritage of their, you know, their weaving, um, which is different in every country in the world. There's many countries that still, you know, have this amazing craft and many companies will try and embrace it. Um, but I think the key is just, you know, putting a, a modern take on it but still you know remaining you know with the traditional heritage and and understanding that you know these these weavers they're actually you know artists in themselves you yeah. know so it's a collaboration and that's the key really to the success of the business is so that they feel like they have a purpose and they they feel like you know they're achieving something in life um and that's really where my passion has just you know fallen into place because it's textiles and you know and what it means to them as well you know is, is yeah. really what drives me every day and the same for, for my partner in Nepal we, we have moments where we literally could cry when we're working together um, but we always pull through and you know we just have a brilliant relationship and for me that's key to a successful business um, and that's, that's how all right. businesses should be built really yeah you need, you need to trust partners you need to work with people yeah. who you know that they will do the right thing um, even if they're not checking in with you and that yeah. trust is absolutely critical. And so does does this partner, is she the one who um, actually takes all of the, the yarns from these different uh, yeah. sources and, and then actually yeah. puts together the pieces that you end up? Exactly, yeah. Drawing? So she, she takes my designs. Um, so everything is individually designed. And she um, has helped source the yarn for me. Um, and oh, she's, wow. the, yeah, she's, the, she's the one that is also you know driven to you know try new things as well so sh she's always up for a challenge which is great you know yeah, that's and exciting. that's the key because you know we are we are trying to you know carve ourselves a niche in the market for being pioneers of you know innovative yarns you know and i mean I'm, i've just been to, recently been to a textile fair in in italy for that reason to to see what is, is happening in the market to always be on you know on top of what the new innovative sustainable yarns are in the market right now and what's happening and everyone's trying to improve from what i can see but i think it's just down to the consumer now really to be prepared to pay the extra price which is you know always the hot topic in sustainable Indeed. fashion yeah and we'll 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 get to price in a in um in a minute because i think it's a really important it's a it's a crucial topic actually because that that ultimately mm. does affect a lot of things and just to give some context before we go there in terms of um the sustainability factor. I mean, we've talked a lot about um, the various sources you get it from and, and lotus and, and yak and camel and cashmere uh, goats mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I think one of the things that at least I would be proud of if I were in your uh, shoes or in your scarf, so to speak, would be to have the <laughs> uh, butterfly mark by Positive Luxury um, as, a, mm -hmm. as a brand to trust. And so what is this um, 
it's it's literally just like it's a little butterfly right that sits on top yeah. of the product what does that indicate exactly. and why is that so um, to have? i think uh, the consumers need confidence in in the company they're doing what they say they're doing in terms of you know there's a lot of greenwashing out there and that is a big problem right now in terms mm -hmm. of you know sustainable fashion everyone's jumping on the bandwagon because it's the in thing at the moment um but with positive luxury you you're given or allocated positive actions based on you know um, rigorous assessments from from their side um and you get this like interactive butterfly mark that you can click on and see our positive actions so when you go to a product i mean we haven't embedded all the um butterfly mark into our website yet but when we do you'll be able to click and see the positive actions of those particular pieces oh, wow. um That's per piece well um, it's it's more per collection or, or right. fabric you know so it's yeah it's more more specific to that but it's um it's basically giving the customers some confidence in you know your transparency and um it's yeah for that reason it's great to have for our you know a business like ours yeah, I think that's really important because that ties into the question I was asking earlier about how can a consumer, you know, make the right choice. And I guess mm -hmm. aside from the brand telling the um, their story, and, and you mentioned mm -hmm. greenwashing, which I think is a is a challenge for many consumers. Who um, I went to a, a sustainable wine um, tasting yesterday, and yeah. um, one of the things. I ended up learning is that there are um, organic vineyards that are actually uh, producing wine in a, in a way that's more environmentally destructive than uh, wineries that aren't actually organic labeled. Yeah. Uh, but they, yeah. but the producer cares a lot and just never got the label. And so it gets, as soon as I heard that, it just got extremely complicated in my mind. How do I actually pick the correct choice? Um, yeah. And so not that organic is greenwashing, but a, a mark like the butterfly mark, I think is really important to give a signal yeah. to consumers so that they actually know where to, where to go. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so out of curiosity, because this was something that, that um, I imagine some of the listeners uh, may be thinking is, uh, it's a bit of a devil's advocate question in terms of, sourcing materials locally versus from uh kind of the other side of the world so to speak is you know do you ever get this question of isn't it more sustainable to actually source um i mean so you're based in ox near oxford yeah um, in the uk isn't it more sustainable to source perhaps sheep that are or wool from sheep that are down the road for example than to go to australia or myanmar um yeah i mean there's always going to be that argument of course you know mm -hmm. um but our business was built on supporting communities and those communities happen to be in you know third world countries um and you know we wanted to help those those communities so um for that reason yes we are having to ship our products you know some miles <laughs> it is not you know the ultimate you know situation but then again you know i think the other argument is that you know within a, a product well there's so many different components you know and yeah. actually even if you were to produce in the UK, you know, not all of your products are necessarily going to be coming from the UK because there's not just the, there's the yarn, obviously, before it gets um, spun. So if you look at companies up in Scotland who are producing wool products and have been for, cent for you know, family tradition of 20 or so years, they are actually, um, I think they're, they're buying their yarn or cashmere yarn from China, but then they're finishing them in the UK. And so, Scottish. yeah, and it's the same with the Italian thing, you know, the, the big brands are, are you know the luxury brands are, are manufacturing in china but then finishing them in italy like i finishing by putting labels mm -hmm. and details you know not actually manufacturing the whole the whole piece so i think you know we have to be honest about these things and also there is the the trims and the labels you know to consider mm -hmm. um the packaging you know so it, it's yeah it's a challenge i mean it's never it's never going to be perfect but I think we just have to focus on what our values are and what we are achieving and, and be positive about that. And the, the thing we obviously do with our shipping is that we offset the carbon footprint, um, which is something we can, you know, we can do at least. All right. Um, and obviously plant as many trees as possible. That's <laughs> and lovely. the other big thing really is um, to make the point that um, we make, like we, we're trying or working towards um, combining shipments. So um, as we grow, 
you know inevitably um we will introduce probably another workshop at some point so we're, we're just sampling you know with another workshop which we you know i travel to nepal many times to assess them myself personally um we might eventually want to combine shipments so that we don't ship you mm. know two shipments so there is being you know more careful with the amount of shipments that you ship you do you do there's reducing the the packaging when you ship which is also something we're working on mm -hmm. um and then and then there's the other big point really and um, which i don't think we've covered which is that we make to demand essentially by being products that's hand woven essentially we're not we're not over producing we make quite small quantities and small runs of things and um that's the beauty of hand weaving it's not you know you don't have to work to high minimums like big factories mm -hmm. um you can you can see what works and test it and and be sure that you're not overproducing and if and if we do we actually turn it into um something else so i think um it's another topic to cover but it's the zero waste um aspect of the business which we're um working hard to you know improve on every year so yeah i mean that would be my argument for um working over overseas and rather than locally but i think you know there will be a time when we probably will look at some local weavers, you know, mm. in Scotland or Ireland, or there's so many amazing, you know, small enterprises around that we could, you know, certainly look at introducing as well. Um, you mentioned zero, zero waste. And I think that that's plus making to order um, is another really important point. Yeah. When you make to order, you know, Absolutely. there's a lot less waste. Um, yeah. The waste that you do have, um, first of all, you reduce it a lot. And what is it exactly that you're... Yeah doing to prevent yeah so um i think it, the first uh, project we worked on was just simply taking the um the ends of the um the loom the the, the fabric which get cut off the off cuts basically mm -hmm. and turning them into tassels so just a simple thing but um it's you know just a little extra that we like to you know do to keep you know the waste to a minimum mm -hmm. and then next season we decided that we would because there's obviously going to be some pieces that reject rejected in production you know and it has to be I like we we like the beauty of imperfection, but if there's an actual flaw that's going to cause you know a customer to return it, then we you know we have to reject it. Yeah. Um. So therefore, you know, we want to do something with those pieces that you know have been rejected. So we decided we would turn them into headbands. So we've basically also given a local seamstress who works from home mm -hmm. in the in the in Kathmandu, you know, um, an income, an extra income as well. So you know, all of these things benefit you know all round. Um, so yeah, we've done that for this season, um, and we've also now are working on a project of turning our fabric into notebooks with local Lochter paper, which is made from local Lochter plants, um, and it's wow. yeah again very sustainable paper, and it's all handmade in a local workshop that I've met and worked closely with, and huh, so, so we, cool. we, then they have they have a they have a um, connection with the workshop you know the weaving workshop so they they both know each other and they you know work well, very well together mm -hmm. so we're kind of connecting people you know which is also a nice thing connecting communities around the world um and the next most exciting project for me is the collaboration with the london college of fashion um which cool. is yeah is going to be happening as of in fact our first meeting with the students and my allocated team well, actually team that have um applied for the project and have been selected by myself to work on a zero waste project um and with that they've been given a bit of a free reign on on any wasted any wastage that we have they'll be given you know free reign to turn it into something creative and it might be another garment it might be an interior it might be taking the fiber and, and putting it through a recycling process with a mill or you know we don't know what their plans are but we i'm giving them free creative reign essentially and it's going to be really exciting so that sounds like uh, so that much fun to see what they showcase. come up with yeah exactly and i you know i just and i also love to support the students and work with the students because you know this is you can see there's a big change happening in the universities particularly mm -hmm. you know i mean actually not just in london i've seen it you know in the in lots of the universities around the world but it's becoming a big thing now for the students to work with waste materials or um dead stock and or you know come up with you know innovative solutions to you know the crisis that is fashion and fast fashion particularly right yeah. now um and going back to the topic that we promised we would talk about and then pricing of the, of your products because yeah. i think this is an important part of of the story um and it's something that 
I know that you you mentioned on your website in terms of of the importance of the craftsmanship and the uniqueness of the product and how that ties into the price. So c can you give us a little bit of context in terms of the pricing and the pieces and and yeah, kind of how you got to that those numbers? Yeah. Well, obviously we're using um, luxury yarns essentially, which you know are not cheap. Uh, number one, number two is that we're hand weaving them um, essentially that's going to take you know one two days even three days for a piece oh. um and so you put that into the equation you, then you pay the workers a living wage um everyone across the chain a living wage if possible you know from the which is probably done in fast fashion yep. yeah based on what we were talking about at the yeah, beginning yeah yeah um and therefore you know for the prices that we're charging that's that's uh that's necessary you know we have to we have to charge these prices but we did always um, position ourselves at the luxury end of the market for, for that reason because you know we are um, going back to the traditional luxury um, business model which was one you know which was about craft and artisanal pre you know produced goods um, unfortunately it's become very much you know well yeah, hopefully it will be going back that way there's a big you know movement back towards the craft but it has for many years been about you know more trends and um, you know mass production so I guess um, for us, you know, yes, it's where we're positioning the market. The prices reflect that. But if you want to be sustainable, then, you know, there are, you know, obviously the other ways of shopping other than going to fast fashion. So I think that's the key point. You come to us for something that you buy that's a lifetime piece. Um, it, it's to be treasured. It's, you know, it's, it's our strap line is actually wear something that means something. So mm -hmm. I think that's the key. You know, if you buy it because it means something to you, you'll treasure it. And it will last a lifetime because, you know, the quality is so important to us as a brand. So um, I think, you know, you're investing in a piece, basically. Um, so, but yeah, if you want to get your, you know, fix of fashion, I guess, you know, buy secondhand um, or upcycle, do it in other ways. That would be my my personal advice. Yeah, and I think I think it makes sense. I mean, um, it's like you said, it's an investment when it when it when a, when a scarf is a couple hundred pounds you you'll really think about it it's not just mm -hmm. kind of a, a purchase that you make sort of willy-nilly and you just think oh i need yeah. a scarf here's one um you'll really consider it and because of the um because of that price level you'll you'll really think you know how do i take care of this this is this is like you said it's an important piece mm -hmm. it's a piece for a lifetime and, and indeed i think we were talking about this before we started uh since uh, your launch in September 2017, um, it, this yeah. it really is a lifetime product because you've only had three or four returns, um, yeah. and 40% is of, of your business that are repeat customers. So I mean, yeah, I think absolutely. that's a really good yeah. testament to how it to absolutely. how um, how it works. Yeah. As far as um, next steps, as, as we start to kind of uh, start wrapping up here, um, first of all, you mentioned that you're doing some paper uh products yeah. uh which i think is really cool I'd i i always carry a notebook so oh do that's, you yeah something okay. that's what i'm writing in right now so that perhaps that's Excellent. something that i can um i can look into i'm i always feel um yeah if i can support. and it can be customized as well by Ooh. um hand initialed as well which is uh, always handy yeah that's very nice indeed so yeah. any, any other things that you're um you're looking into as far as future products and yeah, um, projects, I mean, yes. we are, you know, working on some bespoke projects as mm -hmm. we speak. Um, I think um, very excitingly being approached by some um, companies who are looking for bespoke, you know, design work, you know, in terms of, you know, um, innovative yarns, sustainable yarns. Um, so there's that side of the business, which could be very exciting for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's the personalization and customization, um, which is obviously, you know, something that is very popular right now, but also to us, it's quite unique because we can actually hand embroider, um, customers to customers requests. We have an amazing, um, family in Kashmir at the moment, which did our tiger scarf and our crane. Um, and it's a beautiful, very traditional Kashmiri type of embroidery mm. that is, you know, the most delicate and soft and you can't even barely feel it in the fabric that it's, it's exquisite wow. that we can do to customers orders, you know, um, or designs. Um, and then obviously there's, there's product categories. So we're, we're, we're at the moment, we're pretty much focused on, we have been on scarves, wraps, kaftans, um, and some kind of, you know, sort of poncho shapes. We are now 
going into menswear. So we're doing some more men's scarves. That essentially, our scarves are could be unisex, but we're going to mm. do some resizing on certain pieces. So gotcha. there's more appeal to the men's market, which I think is, you know, they're very interested in sustainable fashion. So I think that would mm. definitely appeal. And we're looking into knitwear, which will be hand-operated knitwear as opposed to woven. So the difference being it's 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 run by a hand as, as opposed to a fully automated machine oh. um or even hand knitting itself you know which is something that is incredibly expensive but beautiful mm -hmm. and supports you know home workers in Kathmandu and we are working on some more like unstructured tailoring should we call it but one size because if we start to go into sizing that causes you know overproduction in my opinion so we're keep keeping our shapes and sizes very simple so that you can just produce one size that fits all basically so um that's also in the pipeline um so yeah we're, we're busy with lots of different um yeah. projects as you can see lots of stuff to keep track of it sounds very, yeah very awesome. yeah sounds so exciting um yeah. and um uh as part of all of that one of the things that you're doing is you have your cedars campaign mm. Um, which is, uh, I'm assuming, to help you fuel your future growth. And so can, can you tell us a little bit more about the Cedars campaign? Yeah, so um, we're currently crowdfunding on Cedars. Um, we're looking to raise 70000 um to, like you said, to expand and grow the business, particularly mm -hmm. in the bespoke um, area, which will right. take some work on our website development and um it's yeah also just you know to potentially get you know expand the team so we can you know manage to do all these exciting projects <laughs> and um yes yeah, so we're looking to to raise the money we're very close to our target which is really exciting yeah, you're, you're we're right, on 85 percent ah, so now we're so close but we just need that last little push and you know i'm sure you know anyone who has a small business you know you understand that you know funding is key to mm -hmm. To growth and we're very you know we're very excited that we've got to this point but we just need that last push to be able to you know um carry on with our mission and if anyone wants to join us on the journey please do go to the cedars platform and uh, take a look at our campaign and uh we'll have a link to it in in the show notes for anyone who's um who's listening cedars uh, is spelled s-e-e-d-r-s -E -E so it's missing one of the three e's just in case if you're yeah. not familiar with it um very final two quick questions um first of all in addition to being a champion of sustainable and luxury fashion uh what do you do in your in your day-to-day -day life to be environmentally friendly that could potentially inspire some of our listeners yeah um i mean i i've always loved nature probably because i was i was brought up um my dad actually was a, um, a manager of a nature reserve in in oxfordshire um wow that and we used to be forced whether we liked it or not to be to go and watch badgers um, coming out of their sets and sit still and not move until we saw them okay. or we'll go to watch the dawn chorus at five in the morning with my dad so i'm Maybe very much in tune with nature um <laughs> I, I think you know it, it's, it was in, inevitable in the end that it was going to come back you know yeah. <laughs> into my life but um i think you know being tuned with nature makes you appreciate you know everything around you and the value of it so much more and i think you know obviously you know we do in, as a family do our best and i think no one's perfect but i think for us it's just little steps you know and giving ourselves small targets to try and improve every every you know month or so we try and do something you know to improve so i mean it's even small things like changing your milk from um, plastic bottles to glass bottles yeah. you know uh, deliver milk delivered like the old-fashioned way or mm -hmm. you know um we, we reduce our meat, but we're not 100%, you know, um, vegetarian or vegan. We're, we're reducing the meats, you know, in our diets. And if we're buying meat, we're buying organic. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to try and use organic um, beauty products and skincare because I believe that the, it, the money and the value in them is, is money well spent. Um, and I no notice significant differences from using the natural products versus the chemical ones. Oh, great. Um, and... Yeah, well, there's been so many things. We have, oh, in the office, we have a solar panels running our, our electricity. So ah, we do cool. that. Um, there's, I mean, a whole host of things, really. Yeah, but, yeah lots. I mean, I guess, you know, cl um, when I'm shopping now, I'm very considered. I mean, let's be honest with you. When I worked in fast fashion, I had to keep up with the rest of the office in terms of if you, this was always the mentality was if you didn't come in with the latest outfit, 
you were you know looked upon as someone who wasn't worthy of the job in in the office because oh, you had man. to be you know look the part so I think I had to completely readjust my mindset in terms of shopping which is why you know I'm so driven with this business now and so therefore when I shop now I really do consider do how much I love it how much you know I need you know I need it actually um, and is it going to be something that's going to stand the test of time and you know regardless of trends so I, I will invest in in pieces you know sometimes I think we all need you know to treat ourselves um, yeah. But if I buy any essentials, I try to consider buying ones, you know, that would uh, pay a little bit more that would last a lot, you know, a longer time. Mm -hmm. um, there's, yeah, the list could go on, but yeah, it's, 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 it's baby steps. Every I think we, we mustn't <clears> put too much pressure on ourselves because that's also, you know, you know, for me, I think, you know, there's so much um, negative, you know, news around, you know, global warming and, I think I need, I'm very conscious of having two children not to make them have this was it eco anxiety that yes. everyone's talking about. Um, my son's actually of his own back decided he's not eating anything with palm oil, and that was nothing to do with me. But he watched the uh, videos with the orangutans um, yeah. documentaries, and he's very very adamant that he won't touch anything with palm oil. So I have to, you know, be proud of him for that. It's you know. And it's something, you know, we, we, you know, we respect him, you know, we go to the supermarket and look at every single label. <laughs> but yeah, I think we need to just try not to, you know, talk about it all day, every day and, and scare, you know, the next generation too much because, you know, I think we need to try and look at the positive things that are happening uh, right now with businesses, you know, making changes and, and I think, you know, that's only going to hopefully, you know, be increase and improve in time. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really great point um, to to end on, actually, because that's that's exactly what this podcast is all about. It's uh, you know there, there's so much doom and gloom in the world uh, mm -hmm. that I think everyone is being bombarded by uh, the media, and actually there's a lot of people, and, and you're included in, in this, uh, who are working really hard to yeah. to heal the planet and turn things around and. Uh, it's it's easy to feel that eco anxiety when you look around and indeed everything is made of plastic, um, yeah. and you and you realize that all the clothes you wear have microplastics. I mean, it, it in many ways it's true. I think it's important to remember there are uh, there are solutions and there are people working really hard to to provide those solutions. Yeah, um, exactly. And and if you're feeling scared, it's not really the best kind of mentality to be in to make a change. So good to remember mm -hmm. the positivity and help build that momentum um, and yeah and that's why I, I think your podcast is is a great you know um, platform because I, I've watched a few yeah, back now you. and they're all you know certainly embracing and celebrating the changes that companies are making yeah lovely that's 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 exactly the idea um, and on that note I, I, I know we're a little bit over our our time here so I just wanted to uh, direct people to you and to your website and, and to your social media platform so where if people want to learn more or follow you um, or perhaps even uh, buy a piece or two or three. Uh, where <laughs> where can people find um, Thread Tales and, and sure. more about? I mean, our main place is obviously um, our website, which is um, www.threadtalescompany.com, mm -hmm. and we have um, social media Thread Tales Co, um, which you can add at the end. Um, and we are in, we do have some stockists, but we we're, we're, we're working very slowly on introducing stockists because. Um, it's one of our business model always been in our business model that we don't focus t too much on the wholesale side of our business so um, when we do um, have a retail uh, presence it would be in a pop-up store which we would update through the newsletters um, so it's always good to sign up to newsletters and you receive 15% off when you sign up so that's Ooh, also lovely. a bonus <laughs> yeah so definitely make sure you sign up for the newsletter and um, yeah. just a, a reminder uh, there is also the Cedars campaign, um, and which we'll link to in the show notes. Um, and the last question, uh, the student project is, um, is that something that we can, that's available to the public? So, um, yeah, I mean, it will be, depending on what the direction the students take, it will certainly be presented. Oh. Um, I've got lots of exciting ideas, but I want them to lead that a little bit in terms of where we present the final pieces. Um, yeah, I want them to gain, you know, some um, exposure for it as well. So I guess, yeah, just keep keep an eye on our newsletters and social media and we can update you. But it's all uh, going to be a bit organic with that, how it turns out. But 
certainly if, it, if, if it's something they've come up with that we can uh, scale, then why not? Yeah, it, sounds... it's going to become more available to yeah, the public, certainly. Sounds great. Be fun to, to see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, on that note, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And um, we, we wish you all the best and good luck with, the, with the Cedars campaign. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about Catherine Maunder and Thread Tales, please visit threadtalescompany.com. That's threadtales, spelled T-A-L-E-S, company.com. You can also follow them on Twitter at threadtalesco, C-O, for more updates. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to the podcast to be the first to know about new episodes. We're on Spotify, the Apple Podcast app, Google Podcast app, Stitcher, and really anywhere else where you can listen to podcasts. And also let us know you listen to this episode on Instagram. Tag us at threadtalesco and at sustainability matters today. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks and talk to you soon.